Again, my name is Joel Payton. I'm, uh, I'm a <coughs> professor in the department here, uh, in the physics department here. Um, my day job, if you will, I guess, is, is, is working on anti-hydrogen. What we do is we make anti-atoms at CERN and study their properties. But what I really like to do is write a bike, and that's what I'm going to be talking about to you today. Understanding how you ride and balance a bike is actually fairly straightforward and simple, but it's something that most people, and particularly most physicists, don't actually, uh, don't actually understand how it's done. They've got some mistaken impressions about how it works. So uh, what I'm going to do is hopefully explain to you how you do ride a bicycle and um, take a lot of questions. This is a small enough audience, so it would be great if you interrupt me with questions. But let's begin then. So what I'd first like to talk about is, is how you balance a bicycle. That seems obvious enough. Um, well, what's the problem, first of all? The problem is you're riding along, minding your own business on the bicycle, right? So you're going along. And then for one reason or another, you start to tip over. That's inevitably going to happen. Perhaps the wind blows you over, or something's going to cause you to go over. So people might think, in fact, many people do think, that the way you balance yourself on a bicycle is if you're riding over and you start to fall over to one side like this, that you would simply shift your weight somehow or other, rearrange yourself on top of the bicycle to get yourself back into balance. But that doesn't work. Can anybody tell me why that doesn't work? Yes. Well, there is certainly it could be too late. That's a good thought, but that's not that's not quite it. There's a more subtle reason why it doesn't work. Yes. Yeah, that's more the along the answer that I'd like to like to go with. Um, if you, uh, I'll explain it a little bit. The physics words are center of mass, but we don't have to use those words. Let's just think about it. If the bike is leaning over like this, what am I supposed to do to right myself? I could, for instance, move my shoulders this way, right? But if I move my shoulders this way, what happens to my hips? They go the other way, right? And if I try moving my hips in this direction, my shoulders are going to go in that direction. So in fact, um, you can't really change the fact that you're falling over by moving your hips, by changing your position on the body, uh, bicycle. Because while some part of you might change in position, the bulk of you is not. And that's the center of mass concept that is the fancy physics words of explaining this. So it doesn't really work to um, change your center of mass to keep yourself balanced on a bicycle. <laughs> so what do you think you do do? Yes? You cycle forward. Because if you're falling, you try to keep going straight. And then you, uh, yeah, when you, you, you move forward, you just after that. I, I'm not sure how to do this. Well, it, it is certainly true. The, a the answer was um, that what you do is, is you cycle forwards, OK? And it's certainly true that it's a lot easier to ride a bicycle going quickly than going slowly, right? You all know that. In fact, that's one of the, one of the things that is hardest to teach somebody to learn to ride a bike. If you've ever taught a kid to learn how to ride a bike, you know that you have to convince them to get going. Because if they're going slowly, they're going to fall over. But if they're going quickly, it's much, much easier. But why is that? That's just going forward isn't going to help. Any ideas? Yes? You're going to change where the center of mass is relative to the support on the bottom of the higher You can turn in a direction that's going to be the base relative to the center of mass. Yes, and that actually is exactly how you, how you ride a bicycle. If my bicycle starts to fall in this direction, what I do is to turn the handlebars in that direction. Now, you're, this is completely unconscious behavior on our part. We just don't know that we're doing this. But I turn the handlebars in the direction of my fall. And there are then two ways to think about it. One way 
is using the concept of centrifugal forces, which I'm not allowed to talk about anymore because those, you know, those of you of my generation who had a physics course, you may remember centrifugal forces are called fictitious forces, and it's been decided that this is bad, bad way to teach these things. But I'm going to use that anyway, despite the fact that we're in a physics department. What is a centrifugal force? You've all felt them when you were in a car and you say exit off a highway a little bit too fast. So here's a highway, I'm going along on this highway, right? And I decide to make a right hand exit in this direction. And I don't slow down enough. So what happens as I go along that right hand turn? You've all felt it, yes? Yes, you're a sophisticated person who has learned some physics. What's the dumb answer? What do you feel? No, you're you absolutely start, correct, by the way. You start to tip over. You start to tip over. You feel like you're being pushed to the outside, right? If you're going around a curve quickly like this, your body feels like it's being pushed in the opposite direction. This is called a centrifugal force. It's a fictitious force for exactly the reason you told me that it's really a matter of your inertia going straight, but never mind that. You feel that force as you go around. And it's easy enough to demonstrate that sort of force. For instance, if I take this ball over here and move it in a circle like this, what it does is it goes up at an angle. You can all see that, right? It goes up at an angle because it's going around in a circle, as you can see, but it feels a force as it goes around in a circle, it's trying to go in around in a circle like that, it feels a force to the outside of the circle called this centripetal, centrifugal force. Um, and that's what you use. So when you go down, when you're riding along like this, your bicycle starts to tip over like this, you turn the handlebars in the direction you're going to fall, you start going in a small, well actually a very large radius circle, in this direction, and you feel a centrifugal force which rights the bicycle back up and pushes you back into normal. Actually, most likely it pushes you a little bit too far and you start to fall in the opposite direction then. So what do you think you do? You turn the wheel in the opposite direction, and you now start going around in a circle in the opposite way, which will give you a centrifugal force which will take you back into the center. And the act of learning to ride a bicycle in a straight line is actually the act of subconsciously learning to make very, very small adjustments to the handlebars as you go down to keep that going. Now, some of you may be skeptical about this, but you've probably all seen a practical demonstration of this. Have you ever watched or looked, noticed the tracks left by a bicycle on a beach or even in, on a wet road? Yes, what do you see? Well, actually, I would say that they do go over each other. They're like two snake, snake tracks. And in, in my observation, what, what they do is they cross and they cross and they cross and they cross. They move side to side by about an inch or two. Has anybody seen that on a beach, willing to? OK, one kid. Anybody else ever seen that? All right, well, next time you're on a beach, uh, you didn't know. This, this lecture has homework. So the next time you're on a beach, go and look at the tracks of sand, and tracks in the sand, and you'll see that they're intertwined like two snakes. And these intertwinings come from the fact that the handlebar is being continually moved from one side to another as you go down. But there, there's actually another way of thinking about this, which goes along with a more modern concept of how we're supposed to teach physics, which has to do with the way you balance a rod, OK? So let's say this rod starts to fall in this direction. What do I do to balance it? Yes? Put your hand, let your hand go to the same direction. That's exactly correct. So it goes like that, and I just move underneath it. <laughs> can't continually do it, but um, when I'm sitting here balancing it like that, when it starts to fall, I move in that direction and back and forth. And that's an entirely correct <coughs> but different perspective on what I'm doing to balance the bicycle. As I'm moving, one second, 
as I'm moving along, if the bike starts to fall in this direction, I turn the handlebars in that direction, and the bike now goes under the fall. It goes in the direction under the fall, just like the ruler, when it's falling in this direction, if you move your hand underneath it, when I steer the handlebars in this direction, the bike goes under the direction in which it's falling and, the, and you retain your balance. Now, you had a question. Is there a greater propensity to fall on sand if I like? Well, sand, I was just using sand just as an example of something that leaves tracks behind. It is harder to ride in sand because you can slip out, particularly if you try and make a sharp turn. But that's not the angle that I was, I was getting at here. So if you had wet wheels, you would see that? That's right. If you, if you watch a bike after it's gone through a puddle um, and watch the trails that it leaves behind for a while. Now, this leads to something that in bicycle lingo is called a diversion fall. So if I have something like a railroad track like this, okay, and I'm riding along minding my own business, and not paying attention, and the wheel gets caught up in the railroad track, and what's, what is the wheel going to do at this point when it hits the railroad track? It's going to turn like that. But I'm not prepared for that. So which way, what's going to happen to the bicycle? The bicycle is now very quickly going around in a curve to the right, and so it's going to fall off to the left. This is, as I said, called the diversion fall, and I'm all too familiar with this because on last Saturday I had one. And I'm kind of limping around now, both here and here. Um, this can happen on railroad crossings, it can happen on drainage grates, or as happened to me, it can happen when you're not looking where you're going and you crash into your son. So, <laughs> fortunately, my son did not crash, but I sure did. Um, but anyway, so that's how you keep a bicycle moving in a straight direction. But ultimately speaking, we want to be able to turn a bicycle, okay? So let's think about that for a second. I'm coming along and I want to go out the door. So obviously what I do is turn the handlebar in the direction that sends me out the door. And what actually happens if I were to actually have done that? Yeah, is there any difference between that and a diversion fall? No, I'm just going to crash over to this side. So you can't simply turn the handlebars of your bicycle in a manner that um, would cause, you know, in the direction you want to go. You will crash if you do that, guaranteed. So what we do is actually something more subtle. We have to prepare for the turn. So how do you think we prepare for the turn? Okay, somebody knows the answer, but before you get to that answer, what do you need to get, what has to happen to the bicycle before you actually start turning? Yes? Okay, so that, that's an interesting way of thinking about it, but I, I think that's not quite the way I'd like to think about it. What about you? Yes, you do do that, but let's, let's talk about why you do that. That's the answer. What do you need to do? What has to happen to the bicycle first before you really head into the turn? Slow down. Yes, that's always a good idea. Uh, I think if you're leaning your body into the turn. Well, you just said lean your body, but I would like to say you have to lean everything. You have to lean your body and your bicycle into the turn. Because let's think about that for a second. Let's say I want to turn in that direction, okay? So, but somehow or other, I get the bicycle to be leaned over like this before I go into the turn. What's going to happen? Well, two things are fighting with each other at this point. What are those two things? The two things are the bicycle wants to fall due to gravity, right? But the centrifugal force, which I'm not supposed to be talking to you about, when you actually go around in a, in a turn like this, that centrifugal force is going to counteract gravity and you can reach a balance. 
You've all seen photographs of motorcyclists or something like that who are quite leaned over in a turn. If you watch bicyclists go around in a turn, you'll also see that once they're well launched into the turn, they're leaned over at some angle, sometimes a fairly significant angle, sometimes less. But they're all launched over at some angle, okay? So we have to establish a lean on our bicycle before we go into, into that turn. How do you think then we establish the lean? Most people might say, well, you establish the lean by shifting your weight on your bicycle. But does that work? We've already discussed that. That doesn't work. The only reliable way to establish a lean on a bicycle is to do what some people have already mentioned called counter steering which is that you turn in the wrong direction first. So, you're going along, I want to go out that door. So somewhere around here, what I'm going to turn is in the opposite direction, just a little bit. So I turn in the opposite direction, I go a little bit in the opposite direction. But the primary thing that happens is that the bicycle starts to lean over in this direction, okay? And then if I want to, but you'll see it's not necessary. I can turn the handlebars to take advantage of that lean and continue my turn going around in the correct direction. So whatever you do when you're trying to turn, the first thing you actually learn to do is to turn in the opposite direction called counter steering. Now motorcyclists, if you go to motorcycling school, anybody ever gone to motorcycling school here? Yes, you were taught counter steering, were you not? You were. Okay, but bicyclists are never taught this. It's just something that, that they learn subconsciously that they have to turn in the wrong direction. Now, some of you are probably skeptical about this. So I have two, one piece of homework for you to do and one demonstration for which, or I'm going to ask you if you've ever experienced something. So let's imagine that this piece of wood here this piece of wood here is a curb, either a very high up curb or a very low curb, okay? So I can, in fact, turn it on its side here, a very nice curb, okay? So you're minding your own business, and I'd like to ask how many of you have actually experienced this. You're minding your own business, and suddenly you discover that you're very close to the curb, you know, an inch away. How many of you have felt that you feel glued to the curb, that you can't get away from it? Raise your hand if you felt that sensation. Okay, quite a few of you have felt that sensation. Why do you feel that you're glued to the curb? In the light of everything that I've been telling you up to now. Because you can't turn into it. You, well, you don't know up here, something around here knows that you've got to turn into the curb to get away from the curb, and you're blocked. So you're just stuck by the curb, and you really can't get away, okay? Or you can get away only very, very slowly from that curb. It actually can be quite a scary sensation, because you can go for 20 or 50 feet, inches away from a curb, which is going to kill you if you fall, fall off of it or crash into it. And there's nothing that you could do. I mean, you could come to a stop, but that's against sort of the, the Lord. <laughs> you know, that's like stopping for stop signs. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. So that's how we, um, that's how we steer a bicycle and, and uh, balance it. But notice that one of the things that I have not mentioned in this lecture so far is a concept called angular momentum. I'm sure you've all heard of angular momentum, right? When you have a wheel that's spinning, it has a lot of angular momentum, okay? And, um, well, angular momentum works for things like hoops. Can somebody stand up in front of that bicycle? I don't want that. I doubt that this hoop will get all the way there, but I don't want this to crash into there. So if you roll a hoop down the floor like that, <laughs> angular momentum plays a role in keeping that hoop upright. And angular momentum can be a very, very powerful thing. Um, for instance, 
Here is a demonstration that we have over here. Um, this isn't the one I thought we had. But, okay. Here's a demonstration like this. Um, this here's a wheel that's going around. And I'm just going to, shoot. I'm going, I'm going to let it go like this. And it doesn't fall, right? Well, <laughs> you know, if I was just holding this without it spinning, it would just fall, right? If I hold it like this, it just falls like this. And yet, when I get it going, come on. When I go, get it going like this, I'm not holding it up. It's, it doesn't fall. And this is a gyroscopic effect. It's a very complicated thing. It's very hard to understand. Most, but most physicists believe that angular momentum has something significant to do with the way a bicycle behaves. I once gave a version of this lecture in a sort of private thing that the professors have here. And there were three Nobel Prize winners in the audience. And they all said that, of course, angular momentum matters to a bicycle. Angular momentum does not matter. To, a, to first approximation to how a bicycle works. And there's a reason for that. Um, here's the reason. Here's my bike wheel. This is admittedly a pretty good bike. Not the best out there. So I want you to stare at this wheel for a second. I can pick this wheel up with my pinky without any trouble, less than my pinky. How much does this weigh compared to me? A, a, a totally negligible amount. So while angular momentum certainly exists in the wheel, it's got nothing on my stomach. <laughs> and it's really not going to influence the way the bike behaves, because it's just too small a force to influence this. It's got to be these things that we've been talking about up to now having to do with when, which way you turn. I, I, I'm sorry, steering into your lean and things like that. OK, so. I have a question on that. Sure. Do you think angular momentum has something to do with how fast you're going that you can balance more easily? OK, that's a, a little bit more of a subtle question, but it's a good question. And to do that, I'm going to use just the tiny, tiniest little bit of math, if you don't mind, because um, <laughs> that's <laughs> if you're going around in a circle like that, okay? Don't worry, don't leave. I'm not using that. <laughs> <laughs> There's the radius of the circle. So here I am trying to ride around. I can't throw a bicycle trying to ride around in a circle like that, okay? There's a radius of this curve, which we'll call r, and there's a velocity with which we're going around, v. And the size of this mythical centrifugal force, which we'll call f, is proportional to the velocity squared divided by the radius, okay? What does that mean? It means that if you need a certain force to write yourself back up, if you're going quickly to get the same size force, if this is very large, the radius can be very large compared to if you're going slowly. If you're going slowly, this is small. So to make this significant, the radius of turning, the turning radius has to be small as well. And that's why it's easier to ride a bicycle fast rather than slow, because when you're riding the bicycle fast, only tiny, tiny adjustments to the wheel will give you enough of a force to come to write yourself back up. But if you're riding very slowly, I mean, as I was, well, there are other effects coming in to play. But as, as, as I showed you earlier, when you're riding a bicycle slowly, I didn't put this there. Sorry, I'm not going to. What happened here? Um, I'm not going to ride it because I have to adjust my front wheel properly. Um, but when you're riding it very slowly, as I showed you earlier, you really have to turn the wheel backwards and forwards. It's just much harder to do that. 
than when you're writing fast. So that's the answer to your question. Are there any other questions before I move on? Okay, so it actually turns out that if I want to ride out that door right over there to my left, I think I've convinced all of you by now that the first thing I have to do is to turn the wheels in the opposite direction called the Hampton steering. But the fact of the matter is that I never have to turn the wheel in this direction. I can always push in the opposite direction and I will still get out that door. That sounds like an almost unbelievable statement. Maybe you agree that to that the first thing I have to do is to count the stairs to turn in the wrong direction. But surely, eventually, I have to turn the wheel back to go in the proper direction. That turns out not to be the case. And here's my second homework exercise for all of you. How many of you are locals to Berkeley? Most of you, many of you. But in every neighborhood, you can find some long street which doesn't have too much traffic and it is basically straight with a slight downhill. The street I'm thinking about that I've done this experiment here on Berkeley is Monterey, if you know where that street is over on the no north side of campus. So here's what I want you to do. Is get on your bicycle, and because we're all from Berkeley or close enough, we, we can get into a very zen-like <laughs> state on our bicycles. We can calm down so that we're not jerking around and riding as smoothly as we possibly can. Okay? So you have two hands on your handlebars. Take one hand off. You can all do that, right? So now we're riding with one hand. And then what I want you to do is to do something a little more subtle. Take that uh, one hand that is still attached to the bicycle and just push the handlebar with the back side of your hand. Push the handlebar, say, in this direction. If I push with my right hand, the hand bike is going to, handlebars are clearly can only go in the left direction. Everybody agree? There's no way I can turn the handlebars back in the right direction. But I guarantee that if you do this calmly and carefully without a lot of extraneous dancing on top of the bicycle, that if you push the handlebars in this direction, the bicycle will actually go in the opposite direction. You never have to turn the handlebars in the direction that you want to go in which is an amazing thing, but has to do with the design of the bicycle. And that's what I'd like to talk about next. If you take a look at this bicycle, it has a steering axis. That steering axis is the projection of this line down, okay? So if we take, this is an axis around the bike steers, and if I project that down with this ruler, I would, um, I would get, in this case, a point that's just about here. Everybody see that? But notice something rather subtle about this. That my steering axis projected down to here, but that's not where the wheel touches the ground. The wheel touches the ground slightly in back of that point. I know my bike body was shielding the people on the left-hand side, so I'll do it again. So I'm going to put this ruler down following the steering axis to the ground like that. Okay, so the steering axis is hitting the ground someplace about here, but the point of contact of the front wheel is actually behind that point. And this is this distance that the point of contact of the wheel trails the steering axis is called the trail on a bicycle, okay? Forget all the fancy stuff in the design on a bicycle. You can go into a bike store these days and you can spend anywhere from, well, maybe not in this country, but $50 in other countries to, to I think apparently in Manhattan you can spend $30,000 on a single bicycle. None of it matters compared to the trail, which is really the only important criterion on a bicycle because what does the trail do for you? What the trail does for you is it turns the wheel automatically in the correct direction. You all know this. If I take a bicycle and lean it over in one direction, what did the wheel just do? It turned in the direction that the bike was leaned to. Put it straight up like that. 
lean it over, and the wheel will turn in the direction that the bike was leaned into. The reason why it does that turn, and I'll do it for this side too, because I think you probably all saw that, lean it like that, lean it like that, and it leans over, okay? The reason why it does that is a sort of subtle thing about the torques around the axis. Get a little bit technical here, but the ground at this point is pushing upwards on the wheel, right? And if the bike is leaned over like this, actually, could one of you come and pull the bike for me over on the side? It, no, not actually, on the back, back. yes. Yeah. What's your name? Matt. Matt, can you just hold the bike over like this as an angle? So think about it for a second. The bike wants to spin around this, this uh, steering axis. Now there's a force from the ground which is applied at the point of contact, which is pointing up. But the bike is leaned over, so up has a little bit of force component as far as the steering axis is concerned. In this direction, it's going to torque the wheel in this direction. And that is what makes the wheel turn. Thank you, Matt. That is what makes the wheel turn in the proper direction, is that little trail interacts with a little bit of a torque on the front and makes the bike steer properly. So the reason why you never have to turn the front wheel in the proper direction is that you counter steer. So I'm trying to go out that door. So I turn the handlebar like this. The bike leans over at an angle like this, which I'm exaggerating now and the wheel automatically turns in the direction that I want to go in. It's magic. <laughs> it's magic that actually took bicycle manufacturers about 50 years to figure out how to make the trail on a bicycle. If you go, there's a guy named David Jones who went and did research on, went to old museums where they had old bicycles and he measured the trail on these old bicycles and they were all over the place until they gradually started to converge as bicycle manufacturers realized that the trail was important. They converge into a range now, which is a couple of centimeters to maybe five or at most 10 centimeters. Now, there are different trails for different applications for a bicycle. If you have a bicycle, um, you may have heard that there's, for those of you who are engineers anyway, that there's a trade-off between between maneuverability and stability on, a, on say, a, a fighter airplane or something like that, a fancy car. You know, your old Buick Skylark would go down a road straight just fine. You didn't even have to have your hand on the wheel, but try taking it around a turn while some fancy German thing, I mean, aside from the fact that it costs, you know, like $100,000 or something like that, um, you have to be actively steering it all the time, but it's very, very maneuverable. The same thing is true in a bicycle, that by controlling the length of the trail, you make the bicycle more stable or more maneuverable. And if you go and look at very cheap bicycles, what I would, because in my snobbish way, would call a department store bicycle, you'll find that they have very long trails. Why is that? Because people only get to surreptitiously ride them in a department store in straight lines down the alleys. And they want the bicycle to seem very stable, which they do. But they don't go around turns very well. On the other hand, a touring bike would have a sort of medium-sized trail, and a racing bike would have a very short trail. Why? Because racers are, there's 200 of them in a pack about the size of the length of this room, and they have to be incredibly maneuverable. The downside is that they're always adjusting. They, the, the bike never does very much for them, so it's tiring to ride like that. One other example, what about a mountain bike? Do you think you want stability or maneuverability on a mountain bike? <laughs> Ideally, you want both, but you can't have both. Most mountain bikes are designed for stability, and why is that? because they're very susceptible to diversion falls. If you're riding along like this and you hit a rock, the handlebar is going to try and go like that. You want the bicycle to make sure that it corrects that. By having a long trail, it will correct that for you and you won't have to do it yourself. So mountain bikes tend to have 
a fairly long trail. But if you're a reverse and you have access to machinists in the machine shop, you can have the machinist build you a bicycle which not only has a strange trail, but a trail in the opposite direction. So can you see what we did with this bicycle? We stretched out the front fork so that the, um, the, front, the, the point of contact of the wheel is in front of the steering axis. Um, this bicycle is just impo about impossible <laughs> to ride. And afterwards, if you want to come outside, we'll take this bicycle outside, and you're all welcome to try and ride it. But this started out life as a normal cheap bicycle, and all we did was to move the front wheel forward. And you'll find that it's almost unrideable. You can ride it in a straight line, but taking it around the turn is next to impossible. So um, I'd like to end this lecture on one more note, which is uh, a note about safety. Um, I thought I had a question. Yeah. Yes. So, so the gyro effect we talked about, that's not coming. OK, so you know, like most things that physicists that say, I'm only giving you an approximate version of the truth. Um, when you turn the bicycle over in this direction, the handlebars turn because of the trail. That's, that's the dominant effect. However, if the wheel is spinning like this, and I turn the bicycle over like that, it also turns in the proper direction. So the gyroscopic action has nothing to do with the basic stability of the bike, but does assist you when you're going in a turn, OK? It, do, it does help the wheel turn properly. There's an even more subtle theory which says that the bicycle hat behaves um, like a pendulum, an upside down inverted pendulum that's split in the middle, this being the split. And it's a little controversial at the moment how much that matters. Yes? So uh, an experienced cyclist can cycle without holding the just for fun, that you don't have to hold yes. the bottom of the cycle. So does it all have something to do with that? OK, so you know. I, I spent a long morning in a parking lot trying to figure out how you cycle with no hands. And here's, here's what I think you do. Okay, if I want to go in this direction towards all of you, I believe that what I do is lead with my shoulders. So in other words, what I do is shift my body weight so my shoulders go in the direction I want to turn. But is that the only thing that happens? No, the other thing that happens is my hips go in the wrong direction, right? Which leans the bicycle in the wrong direction, which does what? Starts, my, starts me leaning in the proper direction, which then automatically turns the wheel in the proper direction, and I go around in the direction that I want to go. I'm not absolutely certain about this, because it's pretty hard, it's pretty hard to do this, OK? So the last thing I wanted to talk to you is, is a demonstration um, about safety. I always wear a bicycle helmet. I seem to crash about once a decade, so I should be good for another 10 years. <laughs> um, this time when I crashed, I didn't hit my head at all, but I have crashed hitting my head. And you see dents in your helmet when you do that, and that's when you know you were really glad that you had a helmet on. But very briefly, I'd like to talk about why, what helmets do for you. For instance, if I was to take a military helmet, would that do very much for me in a crash? Why not? It doesn't deform, is the answer. A military helmet is good for stopping a projectile, but that's not what you want to happen. The re way a helmet works is that the, the foam crushes. And that means that when you bang your head into the wall, this guy was one of my students about a semester ago. And boy, did I bang it my head into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want your head to come to an abrupt stop, OK? You want your head to slow down slowly. And just the act of the additional time that you get in a bicycle helmet from the foam crushing inside the bicycle helmet 
is enough to slow down the amount of time or to increase the amount of time that it takes your head to come to the stop. And just to prove this point, I'd like to do a demonstration. I need somebody who thinks they can pitch and two other volunteers. So who thinks they're a pitcher? Come on, guys. Lots and lots. Okay, one pitcher. What's your name? Nathan. I'm sorry? Nathan. Nathan. Okay, and then I need just two people who don't have... Yes. Um, anybody else? Okay, come on. So, over here I have a bed sheet, okay? We're, we're going to, come on, come along here. What I want the two people, not Nathan, you two, to come and hold this up like this. Okay, one on each side. All right, and with, can you use your other hand? What I want you to do is to make, to pick up the bottom of the sheet with both hands. So, so it makes some sort of a scoop that will catch things, okay? <laughs> and then in a, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to hold this up as high as you can. But you've got to keep the bottom up so it catches things. This isn't a really good cheese, is it? <laughs> 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 you have to bring this hold here. And here, and, and if you back up so you can kind of talk to each other. So, Nathan, this sheet is going to be your target, and your ball is going to be some eggs. These are all real eggs. They'll crack. I'll show you. Real eggs. And, Nathan, what I want you to do without hitting the wall, and frankly, one of my neighbors came to this talk about a decade ago and he missed the sheet. <laughs> it's a real mess. But what I want you to do is throw that ball. You, need, you guys need to stand a little bit further away from the wall. As hard as you can into this sheet. You can come up close, okay? <laughs> and no matter how hard you throw that, that ball, the egg is not going to crack. Okay, and these guys will catch it in that little U bend that we've got at the bottom of the sheet. Ready? Yeah. Uh, see? Oh. <laughs> it did not crash. A little scrambled, perhaps, but not crashed. It cracked. So why is that? What happened? What happened was when the egg hit the sheet, the sheet hooked up out behind the egg and brought the egg to a slow stop. Okay? And that's exactly how a vice helmet works. Thank you very much, Nathan, and um, you too. Okay, um, just put the sheet down. <laughs> yes. Do you have one of those old original bell comments? Um, I think You know, honestly, I don't know the answer to that question, but technology has moved on. There's actually a new design of helmets out on the market now, which may be substantially better than my helmets. They're very expensive at the moment, about $150. But they, have a, they, they guard against torques as well. So while I'm sure it's better for you to have that helmet on than no helmet at all, they might be correct that, that, that you're better off with a newer helmet. I mean, styrofoam does degrade with age as, and sunlight. UV light and things like that causes the styrofoam to, to lose its properties, and they may be correct. Yes, in the back. Yeah, you know, I heard this, I just heard this theory about a month ago. Why don't you come up afterwards and we'll discuss it? Oh, I'd like to hear about it. That's what I was saying. Okay, uh, two or five people. 
we, I'm happy to, but I do have to bring this to, to a close. It, I was hopefully going to talk something about braking before I went on. You guys all know that, for instance, if you brake with your rear brake, brake you just skid. But if you brake with your front brake, you can go over the handlebars like that. And so people are taught never to use the front brake, always use the rear brake. That's the wrong advice. Your front brake is a much stronger brake if you know how to control it. You just have to learn how to control it. I was going to talk about energy, how much power it takes to ride a bike. The answer is about 100 watts, and it turns out it's really hard to put out 100 or 200 watts. Lance Armstrong put out 500 watts with or without drugs, but <laughs> for the rest of us, 200 watts or so is about all we can put out. That Think of it, that's equivalent to two light bulbs. It's not a lot of power, but I'm out of time. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards, and as I said, if you want to come outside afterwards, we can go ride this bike together. Thanks for coming to Cal.